Welcome back to our course, Understanding Doctrine, an Introduction to Christian Theology. If you remember, we ended our last session on the knowability of God with some verses from the Psalms that explain the incomprehensible nature of this God. And so while we can know God truly and personally by means of his revelation, him revealing himself to us, we cannot know God exhaustively. He is the creator God, and we are creatures. There is a basic and important distinction between us. We can only know what God chooses to reveal about himself, but even then, we will never get to the bottom of all who God is. So the question that arises is this, is this how are we even able to talk about an incomprehensible God? What is the nature of our knowledge of him? And what kind of language is appropriate and useful to describe the indescribable? It's a fair question. It's what some theologians call our God talk. How do we talk about God? What kind of language is appropriate to describe the indescribable? What mode of communication is best suited to our attempt to understand and describe God. Because obviously, human language can only do so much. At some point, it will fall short. There are simply no exact ways that we can depict God using human forms of communication. But that doesn't mean that we can't say true things about God. So let's talk about our God talk here in our session today. How do we talk about an incomprehensible God? First, our knowledge of and language about God is not equivocal. Equivocal means totally different. In other words, if our knowledge of God and our language for describing God were totally different and distinct from who God really is, then there would be no correspondence between us and him, between our knowledge and God's knowledge. There would be no point of contact between us. And so we would have no way of knowing him. And human language of any form wouldn't even get us out of the gates toward describing him. Thankfully, this is not the case. God didn't choose to reveal himself through some unknown medium that we have no capacity to learn. No, he accommodates himself into human language and thought forms so that we might know him. But neither is our knowledge of and our language about God univocal. Univocal means identical in content and form. If it were, it would mean that we would have exact knowledge of God, knowing all that he knows, and in the same way and to the same extent that he knows them. But that's not true either. While there are crucial points of contact between our knowledge of and our description about God, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. An easy example here is the fact that God is spirit. He doesn't have a human body like a human. Yet in the Bible, in attempting to say something real and true about God's actions within human history, the Bible uses language like the arm of God, which is mighty to save. But God doesn't really have an arm in a literal physical sense. We get into trouble if we think that our knowledge of God or that biblical language is univocal of God's very essence. Now, this has some curious implications for our God talk. We discover that the very pattern of human speech, for example, when we use a subject and a predicate to describe something, the very pattern of human speech doesn't fully work with God. So, for example, if I say, Bob is wise, it mirrors a real distinction between a subject, Bob, and a quality, wisdom. Bob is not identical with wisdom, and there might be times when Bob is not wise, but the two come together through some sort of composition. But the same thing is not true of God, because God, as a simple being, is not composed of parts that he uses or acts in every now and then. Instead, God is identical with his wisdom. And we'll come back to this later, but it means that God, in his essence, 
cannot be mapped onto or fitted into our basic and normal patterns of speech in a univocal way. So where does this leave us then in our God talk? Our knowledge of and our language about God is analogical. It's not totally different, nor is it fully identical with God's own knowledge, but we know God and can speak of God by means of analogical language. Listen once again to Robert Lethem. He says, this is of monumental importance. It affects the way we interpret the Bible. God speaks to us in ways that we can understand. His revelation is true. He reveals himself in a manner we can grasp like a father speaking to his young child. Yet, the reality transcends the revelation. Let me give you a few examples of how the Bible speaks to us using analogical language. Analogical knowledge and language is sometimes expressed through the means of simile or metaphor. When God compares himself with something in our known world, it helps us to understand something true about him, even if the correspondence is not exact or identical. For example, in numerous places, God tells us that he is our father. Now, that's an important metaphor. At other times, God uses figurative imagery to describe something true about himself. He is the God who rides on the clouds. It communicates something true about God, and it evokes something in us that our God is a powerful God and that he controls nature, and so we don't have to be afraid of the storms or think that we have to appease some false storm God. That's what the language communicates when it's used figuratively in that way. There's another kind of analogical uh, language that the Bible uses. It's called anthropomorphism. It's a big word, anthropomorphism. But this is when God describes himself as having physical form or characteristics like a human. So the example that we used before, you scattered the enemy with your mighty arm in Psalm 89. But God doesn't have it, an actual literal arm like a human, but he uses this language so that we might understand something about his power. Or the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous in Psalm 34. Or incline your ear to me, O Lord. All, the, all of these anthropomorphisms communicate true things about God, but they do so in an analogical way. We're able to know true things about God, but they're not univocal to God's very essence. Another use of analogical language is through what we call anthropopathism. This is another big word. I'm giving you all these big words today. Anthropopathism is similar to anthropomorphism, but it refers to the times when God appears to have human emotions or thoughts. For example, there are places when the Bible speaks of God changing his mind in Exodus 34. Yet elsewhere, we're told that he is not a man that he should change his mind, Numbers 23. In these instances, analogical language helps us to relate to God as an active character within human history, within the story. But in his essence, in the very core of who God is, there is no change that is brought about ever. He is, immutable, he is immutable and unchanging. Similarly, the Bible talks about God grieving or being saddened, etc. Yet classical Orthodox Christianity has always held to the impassibility of God, that God is without human passions or emotions. So God reveals himself analogically, so that we might know true things about him, but we recognize that such analogies are not to be taken in a strictly literal sense about the essence of God's core being. Herman Bovink, who was a important Dutch theologian from a century ago, summarizes this discussion well. This is what Bovink says. Inasmuch as the revelation of God in nature and in scripture is specifically addressed to humanity, it is 
a human language in which God speaks to us of himself. For that reason, the words he employs are human words, for the same reason that he manifests himself in human forms. From this, it follows that scripture does not just contain a few scattered anthropomorphisms, but is anthropomorphic, or we might say analogical, through and through. That is, the whole character of scripture is analogical. For the remainder of this session, I want to introduce to you some of the key terms and concepts that theologians use when talking about God. And we'll return to these concepts over the next number of sessions, but I want to put them on the table now so you can mull them over a little bit. Often in theology, so much rides not just on the words that we use, but in the way in which we are defining and using these words, how we use them. So it helps to keep communication clear and can keep us from talking past each other, especially in an area like this when we are trying to describe the indescribable God. A number of these concepts come from Aristotle and Plato, but they've been helpfully used by the church throughout the ages so that we can be as specific and careful as possible in our God talk. So warning now, we've got some deeper concepts ahead in the rest of this session, but I just want you to listen. I want you to listen. Avoid the temptation to skip over the rest of this session. You don't have to memorize all of these words, but I just want you to listen so you can become familiar with some of these concepts. First is the concept of essence or nature, God's essence or nature. For our purposes, these two words are basically synonymous. God's essence refers to who God is. What makes God to be God? Who is he in his nature? What is he like? You could say that essence describes someone's isness. Who is he? So, for example, the essence of a human is humanity. God's essence, who God is, we label divinity. So that's the concept of essence or nature. Second, substance. We won't use this one as much, but if you've ever read some of the church fathers on their discussions of the Trinity, this word sometimes shows up. Substance refers to the being who has the essence. For humans, each of us share the essence of humanity, but we are each distinct subjects or each distinct substances. For God, his essence is identical to his substance. When it comes to divinity, there is no other being who shares that essence besides God. Third, God's attributes, his attributes. This includes anything that we may predicate of God, any of his so-called properties or qualities that we are able to discern from a human perspective. Now, that seems pretty self-explanatory, but there is a slight wrinkle here. As we'll see in a future session, we have to be careful when we speak of God's attributes that we don't conceive of them as separable qualities that make up God, like parts within a machine. To think of them that way means that they would be more fundamental than God himself. And then God would all of a sudden become a composite being dependent on other properties. When it comes to God and his essence, his attributes are really identical with each other. We humans have to differentiate between them when we study them and in order to appreciate them, but they are not distinct in God's essence. As James Dolezal says, there is nothing in God that is not identical with his divinity. Nothing that is not just God himself. God cannot depend on what is not God in order to be God. All that is in God is God. Meditate on that as you try to go to sleep tonight. Fourth is the concept of existence. Existence. 
If essence is all about who God is, existence is that he is. Existence speaks to the category of thatness. Let's tease this one out a little bit. As humans, what you are, your essence, humanity, and that you are, that you exist, are two different concepts. So if I asked you, what is Pastor Greg like? And you answered, he is. You really haven't answered my question. Furthermore, we are able to speak of humanity in a generic way without the necessity of a particular substance that exists. That's because for all creatures, essence and existence are separable realities. But not so for God. If I asked you, what is God like? And you answered, he is. Or you quoted scripture and said, he is the great I am. You have actually answered the question in a totally legitimate way. That's because for God, it is his essence to exist. God is identical with his existence and his essence, and they must be identical to each other. He can't not exist. And if he didn't exist, he wouldn't be God, nor have the essence of divinity. Our fifth concept is potentiality. Something that has potential means that it has passive or latent capacity to be determined or changed. When we talk about a person's potential, that they could become a great football player or that they have the potential to be a really talented musician, for example, we mean that they just need to work hard and perhaps get some help to actualize that potential, to have it become reality, to bring it into a, to bring them into a new state of, of being. People sometimes talk about self-actualization, meaning that they sort of kick themselves into high gear in order to bring out that potential. God has no potential. <laughs> it almost sounds blasphemous to say it that way, but in this sense, God has no potential. We mean that there is no passive or untapped potentiality in God such that he could be determined or changed by something to be anything else that he isn't already. Instead, God is pure act. And so that brings us to number six, actuality. Actuality. Let's say that someone saw potential in me as a baseball player. So I'm being vulnerable here with you for a moment with my dreams. Someone saw potential in me to be a baseball player. And after a lot of work and practice, I became a pretty good baseball player. What has happened is that the passive potential has brought me to a new level of actuality. A, a new reality has dawned in me and in my life that wasn't a real state before. But now it has become actual. Well, if God has no passive potential, and if he is uncaused and already perfect, this means that there are no new levels of actuality in God. He is never becoming something that he is already not. He is pure actuality and pure act. He is the prime mover in all of his creation. There's not a cause that stands behind God. He is the ultimate cause of all that there is. He is always determining, but never himself being determined. James Dolezal of Karen University, who is one of the most articulate modern day theologians on the doctrine of God, says it like this. Nothing about God's being is derived or caused to be. There is nothing behind him or outside him that could increase, alter, or augment his infinite fullness of being. If God is wholly uncaused and self-sufficient in the plenitude of his being, 
then he cannot be moved to some further actuality. This would suggest some imperfection or absence of being and goodness in him. Almost done. Two more concepts. Number seven, the imminent Trinity. Once we begin discussing the Trinity in earnest in a couple of sessions from now, this category will become important. Theologians use this phrase to describe who the triune God is in his very essence. Sometimes the Latin phrase ad intra is used, which simply means God considered from within. Differentiated from this, we have finally, number eight, the economic trinity. This refers to the way that the triune God reveals himself and how the three persons of the Trinity act in human history and the sorts of roles that they take on from a human perspective. How God reveals himself to us in everything that he does and is. Now, this distinction between number seven, the imminent Trinity, and number eight, the economic Trinity, is really, really important. We have to recognize the analogical relationship between how God interacts in creation and who he is in himself. A number of false teachings throughout the centuries have arisen from neglecting this distinction. For example, just because God the Son is born and lives a life of necessary obedience to God the Father in his earthly ministry, this doesn't mean that some sort of authority and submission relationship can be mapped into and onto the very essence of God and the eternal relations between the Father and the Son. When we talk about the economic trinity, we're talking about the manner in which the triune God reveals himself to us, the effects of what we can see in redemptive history and in the Bible. The Latin phrase, ad extra, considered from the outside, God considered from the outside, that is from a human perspective, is sometimes used here. Whew, there we are. We've, we've made it through some of these heavy concepts. And aren't you thankful that there won't be a quiz here at the end of this session? But let's end with one text from scripture that encapsulates some of the concepts that we've introduced today. Exodus chapter 3 verses 13 through 15. This is just after Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush. And then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Our God when asked his name, simply responds with, I am. His essence is identical with his existence. And he is Yahweh, verse 15, the Lord, the God of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh. That's his personal name that he reveals to his people, Israel. And in our next session, We'll talk about this name and some of the other names and titles used of our God in the Bible. But I leave you with another practical question. How does the fact that God is incomprehensible yet knowable at the same time lead you to praise and worship him more passionately? <laughs>